Do you like a project? Do you not have six years to build something from scratch on your driveway? Or maybe you don't have a driveway or a garage at all, but you want something to take to the track day, something to drive that's fun at the weekend, or maybe you just want something to drive for the hell of it. Well, we've got you covered, but that probably makes us a bad influence. This is a perfect example of something that you can have that is a lot of car for not that much money. This is a Mitsubishi 3000 GTO, and it's also the twin turbo version. Now, some places it was called the 3000 GT, the GTO, various different names. These came in a few different varieties. They all had the V6 in front, 24 valve, and the original non-turbo ones were about 220-ish horsepower. Not too bad, but this one, is 282 horsepower. They did also do a 300 horsepower version, which was for the American market, and the European ones actually had a slightly different turbocharger on so that they could better handle the autobahns, which had a slightly lower uh, discharge temperature, apparently. In terms of this being a lot of car for the money, you would think the absolute zenith that Mitsubishi could produce in the early 90s, this is a 1993 example, something that was designed essentially to go up against the Honda NSX and in fact beat it in 0-60, to admittedly in the American guys with a few extra horsepower, this was faster to 60 than the NSX. I have no doubt the NSX all round was an absolutely amazing car, probably handled better, was lighter. This thing's about 1.8 tons. It is quite the heavy beast and the NSX is very much not. It is a light, nimble machine. But this is a hell of a thing just on its own. It has four wheel drive, it has four wheel steering, it has active aero front and rear. It has all the mod cons that you could possibly throw into this car. It has cruise, aircon, electric seats, electric mirrors, sunroof. You can actually pop the whole sunroof out so you can put it in the back and have what is basically an open top, but you still have the full rigidity of a full framed car, which isn't a convertible. This has so much tech. It even has steering wheel controls, which admittedly, only worked with the original radio, and that radio is long gone at this point, but the fact that it had them from the factory, steering wheel controls in 1993, that's not something we see on every single modern car today in 2023. Almost, but not quite everything. But one of the most important things that this car has, which lifts it up to a better level than just about anything else, is pop-up headlights. Now, I'm not going to kid you here. This is not a pristine example of this car. You can tell that just by looking at it. But by the same token, this is also not a top dollar car. We've spent a few thousand pounds building our car on the driveway, and this is by any measure more car. It is more powerful, it is more together, it has more options, it is more comfortable to drive in, it's finished, it works, it drives, it's mechanically pretty good, all things considered. And this, when it was purchased, was just over three and a half thousand pounds, which for all of this, for something that was, I think, the better part of about $60,000 new at the time, is an absolute steal. The fact that this thing can be bought for three or 4000 even today on the market now, you can pick them up for four or £5,000 in this kind of condition. Obviously, they go up the better condition that they're in. But having something that's mechanically good is half the battle. You can fix a lot of the stuff. It's a red car from the 90s. I've had red cars from the 90s before, and they go pink. You just accept it. You buy shares in T-Cut, and you deal with it. Now, if you want to stop that happening, you can lacquer it, which this one originally was lacquered. And the problem, for the most part, with the paint is a lot of the lacquer is cracked and peeled off over some period of time. You don't necessarily want a pristine example because you're going to want to drive it. You don't want it to be a garage queen and sit to one side and go on the concourse at car shows. You want to be able to go out and enjoy it, particularly if you're only spending three, four, five thousand pounds on something to have fun with. And if you do fancy it as a little bit of a project, you want to do some stuff to it, something that is mechanically running that you can enjoy and drive and just needs cosmetic work is a lot less difficult to justify than something where you're going to have to yank the engine out before you can even get to enjoy it. 
So obviously there is room for improvement on this and when this one was bought it did have a lot of work done. The bumper came off, got rid of everything inside of there, all of the sort of telltale signs of rust, cleaned that down, put some rust proofing on because the back end of this does collect a lot of spray where it kicks up and gets caught in this big bulbous bumper that sits on the back. Now it once upon a time had an active exhaust as well where if you really put your foot on the throttle it will open a valve and it will make more noise and it will sound glorious. Obviously, because it's an exhaust in the UK and there's salt, it rusted completely. That's all gone and this has had a fairly basic twin exit exhaust put on instead. No fancy valves, it sounds good, it does the job and it passes the emissions test, which is the key part. Now speaking of all of the other fancy things that this car had when it left the factory, no of course the active aero doesn't work. How could it possibly after all of this time? The motors and servos seem to be alright in this but something in the wiring, because of course it would be wiring, seems to have gone wrong so this no longer activates. But it still does have the wing and the wing still works because it's just a static wing at the moment. Basically all this does is lift up a bit so it changes the downforce profile of the car. Similarly the active aero at the front, which is a skirt that just drops down down, that is also rusted in place. So that might be freeable, you might be able to sort that, but again, those are not things that are going to completely stop you from driving this car. So yes, the car is a little bit tatty. No, it is not the MR edition that it claims to be on the back because that didn't have ABS, it didn't have four-wheel steering, it didn't have traction control and something else that I've forgotten. It was stripped down, it was a couple of hundred kilos lighter and it was very, very quick. However, this does have all of the toys, so I think that's a benefit. I would rather have the one with ABS, if I'm brutally honest. I'd rather have the one with traction control, as long as I can turn it off. I think the four-wheel steering thing is a little bit of a liability to go wrong. Currently, this one still works who knows how long for, but at the moment this still works and it is a fairly common thing to just remove completely when it inevitably goes wrong. Basically when the wheels turn the wheels at the back move an ever so small amount in the opposite direction just to try and increase the turning circle. Now is it going to be hugely noticeable that it's doing that at the back when you're driving? I have no idea, but I'm going to find out because we're going to go and go for a drive. a sub £5,000 mid-90s supercar really like to drive? Well, the fact that it has a pair of turbos helps enormously. Because if you stick your foot down, it goes. Kind of like you would expect from a twin turbo V6 with, well, what is it, about 280 horsepower out of the factory? It's all-wheel drive, so there's no drama putting your foot down and getting away from a set of lights. It's absolutely no fuss. It's not the most nimble thing to drive though. This is not a, uh, shall we say light car. This is about 1.9, 1.8, 1 1.9 tons uh, with all of the uh, toys, the all-wheel drive, all-wheel steer and uh, mod cons, air con, everything else. Now this model in particular is actually fairly rare. It seems to exist in this very small gap where the first gen finishes, the second gen ends, and this one has a six-speed gearbox. Most of the first gen ones are five-speed, and the second gens are generally six-speed. In fact, I'm not even sure if the second gen came in a five-speed, but this one is a little bit difficult to find sixth because it's so easy to clip the gate to go down into reverse. It's right next to it. You, you go from fifth, and you've got to pull straight back, and you've got to be really, really direct about finding it. So. It's worth knowing that when you might think it's a 5-speed, much like I did just on the drive up here, it is actually a 6. Now the ride quality is pretty good, as you would expect for what is essentially a Grand Tourer. This is not, as I've said, the most nimble thing around, and it's not on some huge giant wheels either. They've got a bit of sponge to them, so it really doesn't make for a particularly uncomfortable ride. Now ergonomically for me, being six foot four, I do have a problem with this. And if you are probably over about six foot two, you might have the same problem as me. And that is my, uh, my knees need to go either side of the very bottom of the wheel. Not as bad as some cars that I've been in, but if you're just sitting comfortably, you 
won't be able to um, sort of rotate your knee underneath the steering wheel off the accelerator. Obviously, planted to the floor, loads of room. Putting the clutch down, loads of room. But my legs do sit slightly either side of the wheel, so it's not the most roomy cabin if you're extremely tall. You can see as well, I'm really quite close to the roof too. It's um, quite a low slung car, as you would expect. Getting in is definitely not the most graceful thing in the world. Despite being a very wide cabin, it still feels quite claustrophobic in some ways with this massive transmission tunnel and a very driver-centric dash where it's angled across slightly so everything's pointing towards you. None of that really takes away from the driving experience. This one in particular has an adjustable column. I presume probably all of them did given the uh, market segment that it had. But mine is adjusted all the way out and all the way up. And as I say, I'm still just barely clipping my knees on the bottom. Now, although this is marketed as a four-seater, we all know this is realistically a two plus two. And it, in daily life, it's not. Not unless you have kids you've got to put in the back. There is no way you're getting two adults in the back seat. This one's actually had the seats removed and just got some uh, little panels to close off the boot so things don't just jump forward and it keeps them a little bit better under control. But realistically, this is a very nice two-seater. In spite of the fact that I've just said it's very cramped, it's a very spacious two-seater with all of the room in the back. You can take your luggage, you can quite comfortably tour around this. Because it's a tourer, realistically, this is a grand tourer and that's pretty much what it was designed for. So it's not all bad in terms of the ergonomics. Everything is, as I say, directed to you. So the cockpit is a really nice place to sit. You can see everything around. This one's had an extra boost gauge added on the top, which obviously is much more fun with the turbos going. When you put your foot down, you know for a fact that they are doing something because the boost gauge will tell you. There is one mounted from the factory, but it's just a, a plus minus. You basically either on boost or you're on vacuum one way or the other. This one that's been added actually has the numbers so you know what it's doing. And when you do put your foot in, that's second gear from about 15, and that's 60. So it is really sprightly off the mark. There is definitely a lot of fun to be had with one of these. And for £5,000, these are steel, if you're willing to put up with some slightly less than perfect bodywork. Now there is one complaint that I have about this car, and that is the indicator. It's on the wrong side. Because I predominantly drive European, specifically German things, the indicator is always on the left, the windscreen wipers are always on the right, and in this car they're not. And it takes a huge amount of concentration for me to remember to hit the indicator on the right hand side and not the left, put the wipers on and look like a fool. In the middle of summer, just casually wiping the windows. But it is so much fun just opening up the turbos at every opportunity. Like you could definitely get yourself in trouble in this without actually trying that hard. I'm still doing about 55 down here, but you've got to remember to take your foot out because otherwise it will just keep going and going and going. So if you're going to buy something, you should probably know what it'll cost to keep it going. We don't want to be so cruel as to just bait you in with all of the good things. A service will run you 15 to 20 pound for oil and air filters and 50 if you need a fuel filter, if it's that time to do it as well. A decent set of plugs will run you anything from 60 pounds up. And for the oil, you'll need four and a half liters of five weight 40, which if you're getting something like Moltil 8100 fully synthetic, That'll be about £95 for 5 litres, though there are plenty other options from about £50 to £60. If you're feeling brave and want to do a timing belt yourself, a kit is a fairly reasonable £130, but given how tight that engine fits, expect it to be a real fight. Water pumps are between 40 and 60 but an oil pump is around £250, so that's not something you want to have to do unless absolutely necessary. For discs and pads, I looked at EBC. There are plenty of other options available. Fronts will set you back just over £400 with yellow stuff pads, and rears just under £400. For general road use, you can probably find alternatives for about £100 less at each end of the car. But for track and fast driving, I would go with EBC.
Eventually, you're going to need tyres. This one has 235, 45, 17s, but 16s and 18s are also options from the factory, so be aware this is only for the one that we tested. TR1s are around £100 a corner and will do a pretty good job, but for this kind of boat of a car, which is fairly heavy, I'd prefer to put Pilot Sports on at about 135 each fitted. And if it all goes really wrong, a turbo is between 350 and 450 pounds. But remember, there are two of them, and if you cook both, you're going to be looking at a much, much bigger bill. Of course, if you're taking any of this stuff to a garage to be done, just imagine that it's going to be at least 500 quid and brace yourself accordingly, because that labour charge will add up quick. Driving it on a good day, you'll get between 20 and 22 to the gallon if you're being fairly gentle. If you're a bit more enthusiastic, expect more like 10 to 12. That's what we got on this test. And if you're in the UK and you need to tax it, it's going to be £325 for the year as it's a pre-2001 car with more than a 1.6 litre engine. Overall though, is this car good value for money? Well, I might have had a small wallet-shaped accident regarding this particular example, so I would have to say yes. And you'll see more of it on the channel, so make sure you've subscribed, hit the little notification bell, and like the video if you've enjoyed it. Let us know down below what you think of the Mitsubishi GTO, and what other cars we should be trying to get tested to see what they're like, instead of building something and waiting six years for the pleasure of it. Don't forget you can support us at patreon.com forward slash show or by joining us as a member on YouTube. All of our members on Patreon get discount at shop.pedalbox.show where you can buy our shirts, hats and more. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time.